Warning, there's a strange man looking for love. Also, please keep in mind of the disclaimers. Thank you. Bus stop, 8.45 p.m. Ugh. The man next to you at the bus stop covers his nose and waves a hand in your general direction. Absolutely vile. Learn to take a shower and use soap for once in your life. Your eyes twitch at his condescending tone, his voice filled with judgment, which is to be expected considering it's coming from a guy in a fancy suit. Oh, how flattering. Just what I needed to hear after working nine plus hours. You think in tired annoyance before flipping him off when he turns his back towards you. He's still gagging, playing up his disgust as he creates a large amount of distance between you two. Although not going too far so he can still catch up the bus uh, you're both waiting for. He's probably the sort that's never changed a diaper, you're certain of it. You sigh and lean against the small bench you parked yourself into when you couldn't remain standing any longer. Lifting your arm, you sniff yourself and then wrinkle your nose. Okay, the jerk might have a point. You smell like a mix of blueberry slushy with hints of chocolate sundae thrown in. Not a bad combination. At least not until you take into account that the scent mostly stems from someone vomiting all over your poor uniform. You tried to wash off and wring your shirt out in the bathroom sink as best as you could, but... Yeah, the shirt's probably coming out of your paycheck. Wait, are you telling me that the outfit's like straight from the company? Wait, what? Maybe the smell didn't bother you so much since you've gotten used to it. Currently, you work at Bobby and Bibbles, a family entertainment center that offers arcade games and egregious amounts of greasy food that makes your own stomach churn. Uh, since you know how it's all prepped. Oh, that explains why it's coming out of your paycheck. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You're 100% certain your workplace has violated about a dozen health code protocols. Take yesterday afternoon, for instance. You had a literal staring contest with a mouse stealing cheese off of an uncooked pizza before it ran off, heading for a clear-cut hole in the wall with open access to the counter. And despite telling the manager about this, the manager demanded the pizza still gets a- Just make a new pie! It's not- it's not that expensive to make a goddamn pie! They didn't even opt to throw it out, just argued there was no time, and then retreated back to their off- It was still being assembled! It hasn't gone into the oven yet! Get my guy! Help! And that's not even the worst of the offenses. Most of them were far more disgusting, but you've turned a blind eye each time. Well, not that you've got much of a choice. You're steeped in student loans, and- this is the only job that accepted you after months of endless searching. So in the end, you've learned to grit your teeth and bear it. You sigh again, letting your head rest against the back of the wooden bench, your head tilted up towards the darkened sky. At least the day is almost over. You tell yourself. One more could happen. And then you wince, because as soon as someone says, or even thinks about those words, <sighs> Shit always hits the fan. You look over at the man standing far away from you. He's actively ignoring your presence, which is fine by you, since he's probably not going to be the thing that makes your night end up worse because you decide to jinx yourself. Maybe the buses could wind up running late then. You try to predict the terrible luck that'll befall you when you hear harsh and heavy footsteps. You glance over. Holy! That, that guy is walking towards you! It's huge! A massive bulk of a man. You need climbing gear just to see him at eye level. He's that tall! It's intimidating. When he makes a grunting noise, you crane your neck up to look at his face, but he's wearing something over it. Like, a mask? Oh, please say this guy isn't a result of your self inflicted jinx. He's just some party goer, right? Probably with a costume theme, considering his apron that looks like there's a few red splotches right on the... Right on the what? Right on the what? 
The you are screwed alarms start ringing in your head. Sirens going off left and right as your brain scrambles and tries to determine whether or not those are actual blood spatters or simply dollops of ketchup made to look like blood. Seriously, where is it? I need to know. You're trying to recall if you've seen anything on the news or true crime channels about mass murderers in your area. But if you're being honest, the crime rates are astronomical in your city. Despite the fact that you're currently near the outskirts, the place is a festering cesspool of criminals all congregating together in one area, and no one here is safe. You clench your fist on your lap. Looking away, you see that the other man waiting for the bus walked off somewhere. My guy? Great! So now you're alone with this guy. The hulking man doesn't say anything as he lowers himself onto the bench next to you. You can hear him breathing. Long, drawn-out breaths, punctuating the quiet. An involuntary shiver crawls down your spine and is scooched towards the other end of the bench, making as much space as possible between you and the hulking man. It's then that your brain finally decides to remember the news report from this morning. The body of a 30-year-old man, identified as Raymond Maverick, was discovered strung up inside the gazebo of Winterbury Park yesterday evening by a young woman jogging in the area. Reports say that his will... You dislodge the thought with a fierce shake of your head. Nah, that won't happen to you. It can't. Because that's... Your brief stint of denial gets cut off by the sudden moment out of the corner of your eye. The masked man cocks his head slowly, surely noticing how you stiffened, your body going rimrod straight and locking into tight coil of fear and discomfort. He's staring right at you. His breathing grows heavier, as though your response excites him. A loud, resonating sound inflicted into the silence of the night. You can't even hear the sounds of the city in the far-off distance from where you're positioned, like everything's frozen in time between you and this man, and this moment. Out of the corner of your eye, you catch the sight of his hand twitching. You finally turn your head towards him, trying to keep your trembling under wraps as you shove your quaking hands between your legs, knowing full well that if he attacks you, you're practically defenseless. Where is the damn bus? Shouldn't have shown up by now? He cocks his head to the other side as you hold his gaze. At this moment in time, you really wish you took your trusty old ballistic knife with you as an extra precaution, but your knife wasn't in any shape to offer protection right now, and besides, you didn't know you'd encounter someone like this on your way home from work. The cherry on your, like, horrible Sunday. Then again, would a knife even bring him down, or would his muscle act as a barrier? You could take on a normal-sized guy, but him? Jabbing him with something sharp might wind up feeling more like a splinter or toothpick, and you probably wouldn't even reach his vitals if he went toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Yeah, the best thing you can do right now is avoid the worst-case scenario. You turn your head away, the movement junky and awkward, the pressure of being so intensely watched making you self-conscious about everything you do. You're seriously considering leaving at this point. There's plenty of cheap hotels within the city limits willing to let you stay for a night. A reasonable option and one you're heavily considering. At least. And to remember that you've got a list of things to do when you get home that you can't exactly get- You can't exactly hold off on. Doing so is out of the question. The second idea comes to mind. As you think about just walking home, hightailing it on the long stretches of the sidewalk, your path lit only by a few flickering streetlights. You can handle walking a few miles in favor of big and scary over here. But what if he follows you? Then you're even further away from any other witnesses. But at the rate things are going, you're not even sure if the bus will show up anytime soon. There's the possibility the bus broke down en route. It's a hard decision to make. Stay here and endure the creepy looking man, or walk home and risk him following you. Either way, you need to make a choice. Ooh, I have a decision to make. What is up with the menu? Ah, uh, okay. Screw this, you're walking home, stay, but at the very least, create some space between you. 
Um, hmm. Screw this. I am staying. I mean, I, I, why would I want to create some space between us? I want to get closer. I want to get real close and personal with this ma stranger. I mean, heck. I mean, he could he could be a cool dude. I mean, heck, we could we could probably have a barbecue together. Or, I mean, if he's up for something else, I'm more than down for it. You're fine waiting right here. He's creepy and unsettling, but he hasn't tried anything yet. An oddball, but there's plenty of those currently living in the city who pose no inherent harm to others. You convince yourself you're acting overdramatic. Regardless, you decide to get up off the bench in order to create some distance between you two. You busy yourself, acting like you're stepping away to sort through the inside of your bag, not searching for anything in particular, but using it as a prop to appear like you're unaffected by his presence. You keep within sight. Just in case the bus comes barreling past when there's a soft creak originating from the bench. Then you hear the crunch of gravel, of footsteps stepping onto the asphalt, and nearing closer and closer still, make you break out into a cold sweat. Crunch. Step. Crunch. Step. Your hand freezes in your bag. He's headed straight towards you. The sounds of his lumbering approach drawing near. Crunch. Step. Crunch. Step. He wins at the heavy clunk of his boots, reminding you of the possible force he could use against you. His entire body shaped like a weapon, built to crush those smaller than him. Crunch. Step. Crunch. He pauses and you know he's right behind you. The shadow he casts underneath the yellow glow of streetlight consumes the entirety of yours, swallowing you whole and make you disappear completely. This feels like the beginning of a campy slasher movie, yet it's your unfortunate reality. You want to believe he's a prankster. Someone gets a kick out of messing with strangers, but there's so many terrible people that you've encountered and endeared in this world that you can't convince yourself otherwise, despite managing to do a few minutes before. Because now, he's right behind you, and you feel a hand clamp down on your shoulder. The hairs on the back of your neck stand at attention. You let out a small gasp and watch as the masked man's shadow move, his free arm raising and lifting up while horrific theories of what he's holding cycles through your head. You don't want to stick around and find out. And finally, your brain kicks into gear. Naked on die Oh, God, sorry. I just, I, I just, I just had to. <laughs> Before he can do whatever he's about to do, you dart down from underneath his head and make a run for it. Bus be damned, you're not staying here for a second longer. You ball towards the direction of the city. He, 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 might want, he might have wanted to give you a goddamn towel for your shirt. Why are you running? Why are you running? Your sneakers slap against the harsh pavement of the cracked sidewalk. Your canvas bag banging painfully into your hip. But you ignore the pain because you can hear him. The stomp of boots. You're right to fear him. Because now he's giving chase. He's eating up the distance between you two. You know he is because of how long his legs are. One of his strides probably matching three of yours. <laughs> you refrain from screaming. Doing so won't serve any purpose other than make you lose previous amounts of oxygen that you could use for running away from the masked man. Not to mention, you doubt there's anyone around to hear you. Not unless the man who gagged at you earlier is still hanging around somewhere, but there's no signs of him. And even then, he'd probably turn tail at the side of you screaming and the figure chasing after you because, you know, guys like him and they're not in the habit of helping others, especially when their lives are on the line. You're alone in this. <laughs> that, that don't come hold up! The masked man breathes. <laughs> you grit your teeth as you pump your arms and legs faster. I should probably take him a bit more seriously, but he looks so goofy. I love him. Can I, can I please keep him as a pet, please? The cold bite of air whips, rushes past you, and stings your face and cheeks. A splash of something wet splashes against the back of your hand as you propel your body forward with each step. The weight of your body now getting heavier the longer you run. Overhead, darkened clouds descend, covering the entirety of the night sky. There's a rumble, 
and then a streak of lightning illuminating the world as rain begins to pour down in heavy sheets. The change in sun, you find it almost laughable. It's like you're filling out a slasher movie bingo card. What a joke. But you refuse to let the weather keep you from escaping the deranged man who's become even more frantic. <laughs> He's so much closer now, isn't he? You risk sneaking a glance over your shoulder and scream. He's an arm's length away. Your body's almost within grabbing distance and there's something in his hand you can't quite make out within the darkness. Is it, is it an umbrella? Could it, could it be an umbrella? Could, it, could he possibly want to protect us from the rain? That's what I assumed that a strange big man with a mask would want to do. The only thing you can see is that the item glints when another violent lightning strike tears across the sky. A weapon. It could be an umbrella! He's got a weapon! You're certain of it now! Turning your head back in the direction of where you're going, you ignore the sharp burning pain in your side from running so long and hot. Trying to at least reach the part to see if you can lose him. Any other path will lead you to a dead end. And your body will end up mangled in a ditch somewhere if you give the masked man an opportunity to corner you. Besides, you're the closest to that area now. The body of a 34-year-old man, identified as Raymond Maverick, was discovered strung up inside the gazebo of Winterberry Park yesterday. Now stop thinking about that! There's no way the same thing will happen to you. Not unless. Hands grows on the back of your shirt right as you catch sight of the park's entrance, and you make a sun sharp turn to dislodge the man's grasp and send him stumbling forward and past you as you make a break for the open gap in the rusted iron fencing. Someone cut a small human shaped hole into the wires to let people pass through when the gates are locked. You thank those little property damaging people since it's small enough uh, for you, but not the bulk of a six foot eight man that's currently trying to catch up with you. Oh my god, he's tall. <laughs> you manage to watch as a man hurled towards you like a linebacker on a football field, and your heart seizes in your chest. Turning about, you frantically squeeze through the gap. The cut wire defense tears into the front of your stomach, and you let out a yelp. The rusted wire tearing through the fabric of a uniform. You manage to pull out into the other side, just in time to watch as the man runs into the fence. You stare at him for a moment, heavy breathing on one side and him on the other with one of his hands curled around the wire, and the other in his pocket. It feels like an eternity. And then, you turn tail and flee, sprinting towards the weeds, choking the landscape of the abandoned park. The broken swing set to your left Shrieks in complaint as the wind tugs and pulls, almost sending the metallic chain lashing at your face as you dart past. You hear the clang of a fan somewhere, and you just know he's climbing over the fence. But you can't see him through the curtain of rain despite trying to use your hand as a shield in order to keep the water out of your eyes. Then you spot the gazebo. The one where they found the man. You don't hear the newscast in your head this time but rather one of your co-workers gasping to another in a break room while you were scrolling through social media. A sister was on the scene. She said they cut off his limbs and almost made them look like wind chimes with how they organized his arms and legs. His torso was in the center of it all. They completely disemboweled him. You remember hearing the girl say, right as your foot reaches the bottom step of the gazebo. What about his head and his hands and feet? Usually, they identify bodies by dental records and fingerprints and stuff, right? The other co-workers asked around a bite of a sandwich. The memory of his comment as in sync with you reaching the top step and plunging yourself inside the gazebo. The girl telling the story shook her head. They couldn't find him anywhere. Although his DNA, although his DNA identified him because of his past criminal history. Her words intermingle with the present as something catches your wrist. Your scream piercing the air with violence and terror as your body gets forcibly yanked backwards, sending you tumbling towards the ground. Yeah, I know about his record. Talk about a scumbag. Your elbow bangs painfully against the rotting floor of the gazebo. He went to jail for abusing his wife and kids or something along those lines, didn't he? You stare up at the masked man with wide, 
horrified eyes. He's breathing hard, fists clenched at his sides, the veins in his arms throbbing as if in anger. He did. And you know what I say to that? Asked the memory of your female co-worker, right as the masked man slowly reaches behind him, the thing glinting at peripheral as he draws it out once more. Good. You screw your eyes shut and brace your arms above your head. Riddance. Boom! You crack open one eye and see a palm extended to you. A small little bunny-shaped keychain resting in that same hand. Huh? <laughs> you uh, dropped this! I knew it! I knew that he had something cute! Ah! The masked man says, a bit breathlessly. Your gaze goes from the man to his hand and then back again and something seems to click in his head. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, uh, reach for you, I almost tripped and uh, crept onto the railing for uh, support. But uh, I accidentally uh, uh, drug you back in the process. Uh, here, uh, uh, let me help you up. Officially stud locked, you let the masked stranger help you up to your feet. He then observes the scrape on your elbow. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm really sorry. Uh, he starts patting his pockets before drawing out a bright pastel pink band-aid and help you put it on the scrape. Should I? Whew. I should do for now. He's catching his breath and beginning to form fuller sentences. What? What just happened? He stares at the masked man with your jaw slightly unhinged before you shake your head and point an accusing finger at him. Wait, you're telling me that you chased me down like a madman because you wanted to return some- Why didn't you say anything? You scared the living hell out of me! I thought you were gonna kill me, dude! Uh, oh... The masked man sounds almost sheepish, and he touches the tips of his pointer fingers together as he looks away. Uh... I... tried to say something, but... You suddenly ran, uh... Wait, I didn't realize you were running because of me. <sighs> Why do you think I was running then? You fold your arms over your chest. I thought you were looking for something in your bag and couldn't find it. <sighs> so I figured uh, you were racing to get it before the bus showed up. I thought it was uh, the keychain you dropped. It's limited edition, right? He's right. The keychain in question belonged to a show called Little Lucy Lambs. Um, wait, Le Little Lucy Lambs heard that aired in the early 80s, displaying a cute and colorful cast of, what else, lambs? Who often talk about themes of friendship and doing the right thing. Penny, a pink and purple lamb, wound up becoming a favorite despite acting as more of a secondary character. She taught you to Always do what you could to help others without expectations of a reward. Causing you to look up to her example even now as an adult. The keychain a reminder of that exact lesson. I wonder if that's what the masked man was thinking too as he chased up to you. He's just a big sweetie! Finally, you nod to his question and clench the keychain in your fist before putting it into your canvas bag for safekeeping. Sealing glances at the masked man as you do so. Despite the mask, you can tell by his body language that he appears anxious, uh, if not a little shy. Can I ask you one last question? You say at last, and he jumps a bit, as if surprised you addressed him, and then he nods, the movements quick and eager. Before, on the bench, why were you staring at me? He fidgets. He touches his mask, playing with a zipper for a moment before dropping his hand. I, uh... I was staring? He asks, having fully regained his voice. No more long, drawn-out breaths. You just stare at him, your expression patient but tired. You did go into a full-on sprint on the way here, after all. Not to mention, you had a long day at work. You hear him swallow, the sound reverberating behind his mask. I'm sorry. I just thought you were pretty and made me want to sketch out the design for a new mask. He mumbles a little under his breath, voice soft and sheepish and filled with embarrassment as he gives the rotting floor a slight kick. Look at you, kinda inspired me. 
I haven't felt a spark in a really long time. A mask? Wait, is that why you meet his veiled gaze and point to his own mask? Yeah, I made this one. They make me more comfortable when I wear them because when I usually have my mask off, I can't really... Uh, I'm just... Never mind. He toys with his apron and you realize these splotches of red are likely from some sort of dye he used when creating his mask or possibly even when sketching. The mask man rings the fabric around his fingers. Now that your heart's finally settled and things have calmed down, it hits you now that... While socially awkward and somewhat misguided, you see he's not really a bad guy. He's just a big- He's just a big old bear and I love him! I want to give him a big squeeze! It's actually kind of sweet how above and beyond he went to try and return your keychain, which is valuable and hard to replace. Considering you recognize my keychain, now I'm taking your fan of the show. The boss man perks up. He's doing subtle hops on his feet, now vibrating with energy. I have all 10 seasons of VHS. I sometimes rewind these segments with Darla since she got really creative with crafts and making elaborate costumes. I always wanted to become a costume designer when I was a kid. Did you know Darla was actually never supposed to make an appearance and... Ah! He cuts himself off mid-sentence. He looks away and rubs the back of his neck. Sorry, I tend to press a lot. You blink at him and then your gaze softens. I don't mind. I actually like um, learning more about the show. He's practically brimming with joy. You can feel it pouring out, even with the mask on. You know what? It, you know what it's like having to silence the things you sit like simply because someone said something negative about it or looked at you weird. Really? You sure? I wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it. You say? We can talk at it. We can talk about it on the way back to the bus stop. Hopefully, we can still catch it. By the way. You see, as you make your way out of the gazebo, I never did catch your name. The masked man hesitates a moment, all bashful, as if he's considering something. And you watch as he brings his hand to the zipper, drawing it up a little to reveal his mouth. It's Theodore. There's a shy smile playing at his lips, and then he quickly zips the mask back down all the way again. It feels significant. When you think back to what he said a few moments earlier, in regards to the mask he wears. They make me feel more comfortable when I wear them, because I usually have my mask... When I usually have my mask off, I, I can't really... I'm just... Never mind. Yet, despite whatever reservations he seemed to hold about taking off his mask, he unzipped it. Just a little. You don't know why, but a quiet smile finds its way to your lips. As you and Theodore make your way back, he takes his apron off and uses it as a makeshift cover for the both of you to huddle under in order to avoid the onslaught, holding the fabric over his head. He shares factoids about Little Lucy Lamb's herd that even you didn't know about. Theodore looks animated as he talks, his hands expressive as he gestures around, like it's the first time anyone's ever given him permission to just be himself. It's kind of adorable. When you reach the bus stop, you arrive at the perfect time. The bus pulling up right beside you two. On the way home, you and Theodore exchange numbers. And when you get off the bus, he waves at you through his spot next to the window. He sets himself as Teddy in your phone and there's a smile playing at your lips as you stare down at the name, already seeing a text from him with a few bear emojis. No! But then you catch the whiff of a coppery scent, the trail leading straight to the bathroom at the end of the hall, causing you to stiffen. You place your phone into your back pocket and drop your bag. It lands with a heavy thud in the quiet of the house. The silence, despite the ongoing storm, feels unnatural. No sounds coming in. Or out. You finally make your way towards the bathroom. The hallway feels so long and tedious to walk down, as your heart stammers against your chest, violent and all-consuming. Your hand reaches for the doorknob and pauses. You give yourself one second, then two, before you open the door. And are greeted by a mess of blood and gore. Some of the blood dried along the lip of the tub and other pieces too thick and congealed. 
The stench is overwhelming, and you slap a hand over your nose. This is much worse than the vomit. Your eyes drift towards the small square sink where a name tag rests, and you force yourself to breathe through your nose as you step inside, picking up the small square tag. Raymond Maverick, manager. The cute blue bunny that doubles as your job's mascot holds balloons in a corner, crusted blood arched along his pink nose and rosy cheeks. This is the entire reason you needed to get back home. You couldn't put off getting rid of the residue evidence since you're sure law enforcement will start digging into your manager's death, and if they find any trace of him or suspect you of killing him, you're done for. You always hate cleaning up after your messes. You don't exactly enjoy killing people. You don't do it for the power, nor the high, nor because you saw it as some sort of sick fantasy. You do this because putting an end to people like Raymond always proves necessary for the pain they cause to those around them, putting an end to their cruelty when the law refuses to. You loathe people like Maverick. They bring out the worst in you, and you wield that burning hatred towards them like a weapon. It wasn't even the rumors at your job that alerted you to his abusive behavior, but something you witnessed in the parking lot after you'd just gone off of your evening shift, watching as a small SUV careened past you. You grind your teeth as you remember what he did to his wife in the front seat, watching as mascara ran down her face, one of his hands tangled in her hair, while the other gripped the steering wheel of the car. The veins in his neck pulsed and throbbed, his entire face Red with rage. And their child was in the back to witness it all. You knew right then and there. You didn't even need to research this man's background. You are going to kill him! And so you did. Doing what you had to do. By flirting with him just enough that he didn't even hesitate when you secretly asked him over to your house. The act disgusted you, but you reminded yourself that you'd soon bear fruit. And you did. It was all too easy. Better yet, he feared getting caught since sleeping with an employee could get him fired, so he laid low on the way over. At first, he tried getting handsy on you as soon as you opened the door. We managed to shove a beer into his hands before he could pry your shirt off and then lead him inside, waiting for the opportune time to strike. He downed a good portion of his beer in a matter of minutes, not even processing the odd taste as you tried to wait out the effects of the drug in the bathroom to avoid him touching you again. When he came back, you could see him trying to get up and off the couch, but stumbling. In that moment, and his back remained facing you, you went haywire. Your bodies tumbled to the floor as you charged at him, burying the blade deep into his back, relishing in his screams and his feeble attempts to crawl away. His wails of pain and anguish were slurred, and he asked you over and over again why you were doing this, unable to comprehend why anyone would bring him harm, and desperately pleading for help and someone to come and save him. But no one could hear his cries, because the entire house is soundproof. Not to mention, he lived far out of the city for this entire reason, using the entire solitude in order to avoid any potential witnesses. You felt his body grow weaker and weaker as you plunged the blade into him over and over again. You were lost in a fervor. A crescendo of your emotions at an all-time high as tears streaked down your cheeks in empathy for his wife and child. Die, 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 die! The words repeated itself in a vicious cycle through your head as you tore steel through flesh. You didn't stop until you realized his body had gone cold and he lied limp beneath you. You were breathing hard as you pulled back, letting your head tip back as you soaked in the moment of relief after doing what you set out to do yet again. People like him always asked why. Why are you hurting me? What did I ever do to deserve this? None of them truly reflected, nor repented, nor begged for forgiveness for their previous actions. You aren't a senseless killer. You have your reasons. 
The people... The people who wind up on the receiving end of your knife are terrible people. Simple as that. From domestic abusers to sex traffickers to those who torture animals. They end up on the receiving end of your ballistic knife. Of course, it's the same one you couldn't bring with you today since it's... It's still covering DNA evidence from yesterday. Not to mention the authorities are no doubt looking for this thing, so... It's within your best interest to keep this thing squared away for safekeeping in order to avoid any suspicion from coming your way. Usually you try not to have any connection with your victims, but after seeing what you did, you could help the one to take down that bastard of a manager. And now, he's six feet under. Because of that, his wife and kids are free from his constant abuse. The downside? He's your problem now. He sighs, he turned towards the tub. Yeah, no. That's a problem for later, you, because no matter how many times you've done this, which is well into the double digits, you always get queasy at the sight of so much gore. The only reason you can handle it during a kill is because of the adrenaline coursing through your body. Otherwise, you want to hurl just like the customer who ruined your uniform did. You go with knife cleaning first, and then... And you let the water run over the steel of the blade, imagining a hopeful future for your manager's kids and wife, where they did live in fear of constantly making the wrong move. Innocent people deserve protection from the monsters around them. Innocent people like Raymond's wife and kids and... Theodore flashes through your mind. Yeah. You're certain he's gone through pain because of someone who took advantage of that innocence and there's no doubt people like that in his life who continue to do so. You want to protect people, exactly like Theodore. Those scars, the ones underneath his mask that he revealed to you in that vulnerable moment, weren't scars left behind by an accident or birth. They were intentional. You glare down at your now clean knife. You're determined to find out who made them, and end their existence. Because keeping people like him safe is the good you chose to do for the world. It's unconventional, frowned upon, disturbing, but you're determined, regardless, to find and eliminate every vile stranger you can find. Oh, what in the world? You know, I kind of love that. I kind of love that. Not gonna lie. But we still got one more ending to go through. All right, screw this. I'm walking home. You opt to travel home by foot rather than staying next to this freaky stranger any longer. Pulling yourself up from the bench, you avoid eye contact with the masked man, choosing to keep your eyes focused on the road ahead of you. You listen out for footsteps as you move away from the bus stop. But after a few minutes of walking, there is no sign of the odd man pursuing you. The echo of footsteps only coming from your own worn-out sneakers. You sigh with relief. The night air is brisk, a cold chill on your skin. Above, storm clouds gather and merge, sure to bring in an oncoming storm. Thunder claps overhead, and you frown as water begins to pour from the sky, adding yet another obstacle to your trek home. Then, a twig snaps, and you freeze. The man follow you after all. You hesitate a moment before turning around, searching through the darkness for any sort of masked figure, but find no trace of him or anyone else. Swallowing hard, you force yourself to try and get rid of the paranoia as you continue away down the empty streets. But for some reason, every little sound sets you on edge. A deep-rooted fear of something lurking in the darkness, ready to spring at you when the moment presents itself. You imagine those strung-up body parts belonging to Raymond, replaced with your own, your body hollowed out like the gut scraped out of a pumpkin. A shudder runs through you. You don't consider yourself to be a terrible person. In fact, you even try to return some good to the world in your own way. Others will argue against the good you do. Maybe they'd even go as far as... Your thoughts are interrupted as you hear a slight dragging sound. You peer behind you, but no one's standing there. Did you hear wrong? Frowning, you glance back to the road ahead before your gaze lands on something standing off in the distance. Where? 
a vague human shape. You'll recognize the business man from earlier. But what's he doing here? As you begin approaching him, you feel as though something is not quite right. An uneasy feeling spreading throughout your gut. For some reason, he's staring in the direction of your house, which you can see off in the distance. He remains immobile despite the ongoing storm. You can't even see his chest rise and fall as he breathes. It's creepy and unsettling, and you're starting to regret your decision to walk home. But you're almost there, so you might as well just shuffle past him and try not to make eye contact to encourage any sort of attention. You're relieved when the businessman doesn't react as you walk by. But then you realize something odd. In his breast pocket, a wilted red rose peeks out and you frown at the sight. Why would a businessman have a red rose sitting there? Then again, maybe there's some plausible explanation and you're just looking too deeply into things. But right as you pass him, you feel something clamp around your wrists. And as you look over your shoulder, you see the man staring at you with a haunting expression. There's something familiar about his face that you can't quite place. Like you've seen him somewhere before. But before you can react, Something sinks deep into your gut. You gasp. It burns. The man then shoves you back and you stumble off the sidewalk and into the middle of the street. Holding onto your stomach as you try to process what's happening. When you drop your hand, you see it stained with blood. As your gaze meets the man's again, he takes out the wilted rose and tosses it towards the front of your feet. You look down at it with confusion. Right before you hear the blaring horn of a bus. And your body is pulled under and crushed beneath the bus wheels. Your entire body pinned beneath the hulking steel. As your world turns dark, all you can ask is... Why? Oh, that is so much darker given the context! But why?! Exactly why <laughs> Anyway, that was Val Stranger. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys do want to play this for yourselves, link to the game will be in the description below. So this was actually made by the same developer as you and him, and I quite love this one. It kind of reminds me of Headlockers games. You know, the, um, the developer behind um Robert Guess, uh, Monster X Mediator, uh Creature in the Corner. Like, I just love the trope of a big scary dude just turning out to be an absolute fluff ball. Like, I love the concept of this. And like, the twist at the end was just, you know, it, it, it was in good taste. I, I, I'd say it's, it's all right. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you all have a lovely rest of the day. And as always, I'll be seeing you in the next video. This is Lion, signing off. Ciao.